there is a need, I believe, to recalibrate, to resuscitate. And we talk about recalibrating global justice philosophy, but I ask the question, what is global justice and what is philosophy? The issues and the ideas you have heard and shared over the course of this conference are critical and timely. Only two days ago, the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, held a high-level emergency ministerial meeting on preparedness and response to Ebola. We're not even out of COVID yet. And yet, Ebola is knocking literally on our door. I was due to go to Uganda last week, um, just or the week before, to go and provide some assistance, to have a meeting, to see some people. Unfortunately, I, well, I wasn't let in because I, I my visa didn't come through in time. But now Kampala, that they were telling us was safe at the time, is now got Ebola. We're hearing that the UK government is telling hospitals to be on the watch out for Ebola. The United States government are funneling people from Uganda into certain airports because they're frightened about Ebola. There have already been 54 deaths in this region, recent out outbreak. And I remind you that this mortality rate is about between 50 and 60 something percent. This world is a world in turmoil. And if we were ever going to recalibrate, I don't know that it is time to recalibrate as it is time to start a revolution. I don't know whether that is the reword that I would use because recalibrate is like weighing scales and this is a school of law. So the weight of justice and placing things on the scales a little bit on one side, a little bit on another side. But do we even have time for that? We need those who under understand the times and the seasons that we're living in. We need those to wake up. We need those to wake up and we need a critical mass of us to get together and to say that enough is enough, that we cannot keep going on the way that we have been going on because the way that we have been going on is what has gotten us 8 million, over 8 million COVID orphans, is what has gotten us several million people dead, is what has gotten the UK hospitals today over 85% full, is what means that if you, heaven forbid, fall over tomorrow or walking out of this door, you will not be able to get an ambulance because what happens in Africa affects you here in London, what happens in Asia affects them there in Washington DC until a life in Abuja where I live in Africa the capital of Nigeria, West Africa, until a life in Abuja is worth the same as a life in Washington, D.C., until a life in Kinshasa is worth the same as a life in Kansas, until a life in New Delhi is worth the same as a life in New Caledonia. We do not have global justice, and we cannot talk about recalibrating a global justice philosophy that does not exist. The Ebola outbreak, I use it as a point of reference because it comes in the middle of a COVID outbreak, and yet we have had Ebola for several years, but there was no vaccine. The vaccine that we have, which is in sort of in little quantities for the Zaire, um, the Zaire virus, there, there isn't one that exists for what they call the Sudan variant. So people are just dying. They're just dropping dead all over Africa. Some of them diagnosed because we're not bothered to, to fund the diagnostics capacity that is needed. But the day that that Sudan variant drops here on these shores or in the shores of the United States of America, you will see Operation Warp Speed to find a virus, to find a vaccine, to find a therapeutic, to find diagnostics that you and I can walk outside to boots, we can pick up on the sides of the streets, and all of a sudden it will become a thing. Why? Why? How do those of you who are much cleverer than I am, and when Sridhar invited me, I was like, well, Sridhar, I don't even know that I can spell philosophy. I went to medical school. I'm a medical doctor by training. But my heart is for justice. But the world we're living in right now is an unjust world. And why is that? A friend recently with COVID in Nigeria asked me to help her access antivirals because she was terrified she was going to die because they are not available in Nigeria today. Another woman I spoke to in Botswana the other day told me her 26 year old nephew, 26 years old, had died of COVID two months after his mother had also died of COVID. Botswana is a middle income country in Africa. Botswana paid over above everything that countries here in, in Europe, in North America pay, they pay the highest price per vaccine. The country of Botswana did, and yet they didn't get a single one because others were ahead of them in the queue. I am using these examples of this current 
this current crisis that we're in as a global community. I'm using these examples because they're real and because they are possibly about to affect us. Because soon we should all be wearing masks because soon the first Ebola patient comes into this country, there will be panic. I'm reminded of a quote from late Paul Palmer, who was a friend and a mentor as he and I followed each other, not deliberately, I didn't work with or for his organization, but I was also, we had similar trajectories in life as I was in Rwanda, he would be in Rwanda, as I was in Haiti, as my husband and led the, the a, a, a humanitarian response just 12 days after the earthquake in, in Haiti in 2010, you know, Paul and I were following each other and we had a very similar philosophy. If access to healthcare is considered a human right, who is considered human enough to have it? I would change that. And I would say, who is considered human? There is a song, I don't know who it's by, and maybe Danielle can help me. She used it in a, in a, in a, in a campaign she did once. We're only human. We're only human after all. We're only human after all. Don't take a chance on me. The words I got them wrong. She says I should stop saying. <laughs> but the point I'm making is that our common humanity is what is fractured. Our common humanity, before we begin to talk about philosophy, begin to be before we begin to talk about justice, our common humanity is fractured. I'm not a clever philosopher or a lawyer. We have our daughter for this. But I want to share with you is my experiences and aspirations of how we take these theoretical cornerstones and how we live and how we breathe them in practice. Because my understanding of philosophy is very limited, but it's that it's a way of understanding the world, a system for interpreting reality and guiding actions through thought. As such, it is not something that belongs in the hallowed corridors of university lecture theatres alone or in grand tomes written by intellectual thinkers like Socrates and Plato. Rather, it should operate in the real world as a discipline that hones our understanding of reality and how it is shaped and how it shapes us. Philosophical traditions have often touched on ethics and politics. They set out a social system, a set of norms and values to underpin them. Philosophy therefore has a role to play in the real world and also has a place in discussions of justice and equity, because I have an issue with quite the, the word equality. And I think that we need to very carefully redefine how we, you know, this conflation of the word equity and the word equality, it is not the same thing. And so those of you who are cleverer than I am, who know who are the future, who are, who, who, who are able to help us shape this world going further, we need to stop talking about the inequality of this world, and we need to start talking about the sheer inequity that plagues us as a global community. Equality means that we all need the same thing, but I, I posit to you that inequity means that those from low-income countries, those who are in any way disadvantage need to be able to, there's a little cartoon, Shrida, I don't know if there's a way to, 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 to show it here, which maybe not, that shows that there's somebody who needs to stand on a block. Most of you, who's seen it? Who's seen it? Who's seen, okay, there you go. So I don't need to describe it for you. Otherwise I'd have to be standing on the table and that would not be pretty. <laughs> so we've all seen it. And we have got to stop conflating inequity with inequality. I'm going to use a practical life example. I'm going to use myself as an example. When I was appointed to, to, to be the special envoy to the ACT Accelerator, I was appointed by the Director General. I was appointed, my co-envoy is a former Prime Minister, Carl Bildt of, uh, of Sweden, an amazing man. And he and I meet every week and we chair a meeting every week and he's now trying to negotiate Ukraine. So I mostly chair the meetings every week whilst we hope that he helps us to save the world. But people would say to me all the time, oh, we're trying to treat you like we treat, we treat Carl. I'd say, but you can't treat me like you treat Carl, because Carl is a former prime minister. I'm a little girl from Ibadan. Carl is a former prime minister who has certain, there's certain things that come with being a white man from a certain part of the world, never mind being a former prime minister. There are certain privileges, there are certain, there are certain um, immediately assumed uh, I don't know what the word is. But I came in and was expected to operate on the same level 
somebody who lives in a country where the transaction costs for us are much higher to enter those corridors of power than they are for those of you from this part of the world, because I don't always have electricity. And sometimes, as it was yesterday, as I was trying to, I was trying to do a Zoom call, I forget who it was with, the, there was a power cut and electricity and data went down. So I don't always have data. The transaction cost of the, emo the emotional transaction cost of trying to get my point across because I have lost family members needlessly at a young age over the last two years. The emotional transaction cost of trying to have a conversation as a woman from a low income country that some would actually say that because I have an English accent and I am well educated, I am not qualified to speak on equity or that because I have some level of privilege and I don't live in, in what is considered a, 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 a hut or, or a hovel, that that is what we want Africans to look like. Do we begin to see some of the subconscious and unconscious biases that we work with in this world? And so we talk about recalibrating global justice philosophy. We talk, talk about recalibrating this world, but how are we going to recalibrate the world until we can communicate and understand one another? We need to turn to age old philosophical questions into, we need to turn those into a battle cry for addressing the problems we currently face. Who are we? What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life for me in Nigeria? What is the meaning of life for somebody in Botswana? What is the meaning of life for somebody in Uttar Pradesh? What is the meaning of life for somebody in Washington DC? What is the meaning of life for somebody in a poor community in London? What is the meaning of life for somebody in a poor community in deep West America? Because the inequalities are across the board. The inequities are across the board. Africa, low-income countries suffer the most. But when you look at the, the statistics from the, from the pandemic, those who came from low-income countries and uh, haven't been measured, but it is those in the high-income countries from the communities of color and disadvantaged communities that suffered the most. Mm -hmm. They were the frontline workers. They were the ones who died. It was bus drivers who had people spitting on them, who died because nobody believed that we actually had a pandemic. These questions matter, especially in the context of a pandemic. But not only do we have a pandemic, we also have a war. Who would have thought it that in our lifetime, we now have a European war, a real-time war situation, a war that is causing economic upheaval all over the world, a war that is causing an energy crisis, and this is going to be a bitter, dark winter for many, many, many people, a war that continues the inequity and the injustice, a war in the middle of a pandemic that is not over. And as we're seeing cases rise and people in, in, in this world are getting calls to have a booster, their fourth booster, and yet we still see that only 22% of people in Africa have yet received a primary series and even less of those have received a single booster at all. In seeking answers to these questions, we need to contextualize them and ensure that the voices and the experiences of those who are most affected by the injustice are shaping the responses that are given by world, world powers. We need to ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past as we reimagine, we recalibrate, to use your word, a post-pandemic world when the pandemic is actually post. And we need to do that in answer to those fundamental questions saying that we will ensure the voices and experiences of those most affected are, are included in policy decisions is easier said than done. I have lived this very recently and tokenism is very different from full participation. The concept of equality itself is relatively modern in Western philosophy and became prominent through the works of and words of Hobbes and Locke who linked it to notions of justice. This was in the context of the development of nation states who were becoming independent of an all powerful monarchy and their push for independence and, for instance, the American and French revolutions in the 18th century. 
Modern notions of philosophy are grounded in Western traditions and history. And whilst most people have heard Plato and Socrates, some may have heard of Confucius and Buddha, not many have heard of the South African concept of Ubuntu or the Oduifa corpus of the Yoruba people. Ubuntu is based on the con concept of that we, who we, because of others, and is centered in community, in connection, in a sense of the self that only exists through others a concept that underpins most of African culture today. Whilst the Odu Ifa, which is my culture, that belief system from Yoruba tradition is largely oral, a largely oral collection of verses and comprises a breathtaking archive of reflections on metaphysics, on epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics. However, African philosophy is not recognized or acknowledged because it has not been written down. Largely, it is oral, an oral tradition that is not, it is not an intellectual pursuit, pursuit, but a way of life. It is time for us to write those stories down, because until the lion learns to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. Culture plays a significant part in how we conduct ourselves and how we engage. And this is something that must be understood by those in leadership positions to authentically engage voices from low and low middle income countries and from vulnerable po populations. Social norms based on justice and equity are not a Western concept. They're universal and have existed from ancient Egypt to modern day Nigeria. Philosophers and academics need to help promote a view of justice that recognizes the worth of all humans as equal and that constructs a worldview where everyone has the same rights, no matter who they are, where they were born or raised. However, Western notions of justice and equality have not translated into real world equity for all. And we can see that in the impact of colonialism on global health. The aspirational mandate that we have today for global health is to achieve health equity for all. This mandate often at times appears, appears unattainable because global health policy research and practice are shrouded in a history of extractive colonialism and expansionism of foreign Western nations in former colonies, many of them now low and middle income countries who remain dependent on their former high income colonizers. These are difficult conversations. They're uncomfortable conversations to have because many of us have gone to Africa and we've met and had, uh, or, or Asia, and we've had a, a, a little research assistant who was really the one who provided us with all of the information. And we have written a paper and that person was buried in the back of the document. Or maybe they were the village interpreter who was the one who had the real cocoa of the matter, as we say. They had the real juice because they were embedded deep in the community. But we have come out and we have published it and we have written books and we have made money <laughs> and we have made fame and we have forgotten the communities that it came from. The present day global health architecture still reflects Western hegemonic power and privilege. This is because global health continues to be led, funded and influenced by a limited set of actors. And it is time for that to change. That's why I say we didn't come today to recalibrate. We came today for a revolution. It is time for that to change, but for that to change, especially those young ones of you who are in this room, you need to be prepared to be the critical mass. You need to be prepared to speak out. You need to be prepared to have your voice pushed back. You need to not be afraid of not being published. You need to not be afraid of not being invited to places to speak. Because if I don't speak, if I don't do my best, my prayer is that my ceiling will become your floor. I say this to Danielle all the time. I need to get make as much noise, make as much noise, make as much noise as I can so that the world has heard enough about global justice, equity. They've heard the argument. They've heard that, that our traditions need to be placed at the front so that when you guys get, get into that position, you are the ones who will now carry it out. But where I come as one and stand as 10,000, you will stand in the tens of thousands. You will stand in the millions and you will be the ones who, who achieve the change that we so desperately need in this world. Because until you achieve that change, this world is going to remain a world where we are in pandemia forever. 
a world where climate cl climate change is about to destroy us, where it is now summer outside. I mean, I brought the wrong clothes and the wrong shoes because who knew it was going to be like this in October in London? It's nice, <laughs> but it's wrong. I mean, when I was invited to come and speak to King's College London, the hallowed halls, I, by the way, Shrida, I would like to walk down the halls and take a picture. The hallowed halls of King's London, I had boots. I had nice boots and a nice jacket. Look at me. I couldn't wear my boots, my jacket because the climate is doing crazy things. I say that on a light note, but on a much more difficult note, Nigeria, my country. There are millions of people displaced at the moment by flood. There's the most devastating floods all over the world. The Pakistan floods are going on right now in Nigeria, but because we lack the governance and the and 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 and, and the passion and the and the leadership to truly stand up and say this is a problem, people are dying in their hundreds. Communities are disappearing. If we don't deal with the notions of equity and justice around the world, it's not just around health; it's around climate and it's also around gender. Gender, <laughs> gender, do you want me to go there with gender? Yeah. Shrida, did you call the fire department? <laughs> gender, <laughs> gender, the structures that exist were not built for low-income countries, but they also were not built for women. They were not built for anything other than for men, for anybody who identifies as other than male. That is the world that we live in. That saying it's a man's world, it truly, truly is a man's world. I chair a group that is the world. I'll use my, my again, my most recent experience as an example. I chair a group that is, hi. Yes, I met you. <laughs> I chair a group that is nine leaders of global health in the world. They're all men. So how are they going to know that we need period leave? If we need period leave, because it is not their lived experience. They're mostly men from high income countries of the world. So how are they going to know that in low income countries of the world, the practicalities of life mean that you cannot take a vaccine from a port and magically put it into somebody's arm, Linda, because they do not understand that that logistics chain does not exist because it is not their lived experience. This is why we have to recalibrate. This is why we have to revolute. This is why we have to change the world. So they don't understand that side of the world. They also don't, don't understand us. So when I come to meetings and I bring passion and I bring fire, it's like, oops, the emotional woman is here again. But if I'm not emotional, people are going to die. If I don't bring the reality, people are going to die. And so if we were to get into the conversation about gender, we could be here all day. But recalibrating global justice philosophy includes recalibrating how both sides of this sky are going to be included. I want to tell you a little anecdote, which is one of my one favorite things in the whole world. About 20 something years ago, I was called by um, World Vision America. Remember that, Ricky? And there was a funding, it was a project. It's actually sad that the Dean has left because it was an Australian project. And they needed somebody to do an evaluation in Chad. If they, the evaluation wasn't done, then there would be no more funding going forward. Those of you who do grants and what have you understand this. The country was going into, was in war. Nobody would go. And this was all the water and sanitation and health systems for an entire community in Chad, which is borders Northeast Nigeria. At the time I was in Fiji, the Fiji Islands, our other home. So you were told about my life from around the world. My daughter is a Fijian and we also have links with the Fiji Islands. And so World Vision from California rang me, the president, and said, Yodi, what can you do? Do you know anybody? And I said, I'll go. And my husband said, what do you think you are, Lara Croft? <laughs> he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going. He said, it's a war. I said, I'll be fine. 
anywhere else in Africa. So I got on a plane and I went to Jemena. On the plane into Jemena, I sat next to the US ambassador, the Chad, who said, what are you doing here? And I told him and he chuckled. <laughs> and I, I, I said, why are you laughing? He said, did you really think this through? Anyway, landed. The next day, they said, we're going to the base camp. It was 24 hours from Jamena. They started to land, leap, they started to load up the land cruisers and, you know, the satellite things and all the rest of it. And I got in this car and then I looked around me and there were lots of men in the convoy and I was the only female. And I thought, oh, oh, <laughs> what now? What if I need to, like, go? I mean, just the basic things of life, really. So we started to drive through the desert because it's all desert. And we saw the, it was beautiful. We started to drive. They were so gracious, so, so kind. And, you know, they, they found me some very strategically placed cactus bushes whilst they, you know, pretended to have a party down the road, but were actually guarding me. It was all very discreet. And we get to the community that we're going to, and this is really the big part of my recalibrating how the world works. And members of the community had been expecting the evaluator. They had been expecting the big kahuna. They knew that when the white trucks came with the satellite and the, all the people came from the big city that lots of typically men, mostly white men from the aid organizations would come pouring out of this truck. They had prepared themselves. The hotel I was staying at, the sex workers were dressed and they were ready. And they were like, we are ready. The party has come to town. And I got out of the car first in the village and everybody in the village were like, okay, so where's the big chief? And somebody pointed to me and they said, there she is. And the grandmother started to look. Then they started to weep and they started to cry. Then they started to pray for me and they started to rejoice and the whole village and the whole community came out and I was stunned. I was like, what's going on? And they said that you are our daughter. You are the big chief. You are the big white chief that, that they sent. It means that our own daughters and our own sons, there is hope for them. That is what recalibrating looks like. Just by showing up, just by showing up. I was in tears, it was a mess. And then I was there for about four or five weeks, six in this community. There was no water. I had two holes in the ground and a, and a concrete slab that was my bed with a bit of foam on it. But I would get taken to the big city um, which was a village <laughs> or a little community about three hours away through various, you know, rivers and driving through rivers and what have you. And there I met my friends and my sisters, the sex workers, who were really resentful of me when I first showed up because I thought they thought I was a new talent in town. And they were not at having it. <laughs> so the girls were like, mm-mm. We don't know where you've come from, but no, this is our markets. <laughs> no, this is our, and then they got it. They're like, oh my God, you're one of those guys that comes to do the work. And over six weeks, I learned their stories and they learned mine. They would braid my hair as I would come home every Friday and we would hang out and I would, you know, had a satellite phone. I would Skype Danielle who was little. And the most incredible thing happened to me the day I was leaving. These girls who I arrived as a rival, or in their eyes, had gone and they had taken their hard earned money and they had bought me the most beautiful shawl because they said, you carry us with you and we continue to do what we do because we know that our daughter one day can be you. I'm not here to give a clever philosophy lecture. I'm here to tell you about the practicalities of what equity 
and equality and not recalibrating those systems mean in our lives. I'm here to tell you about the practicality of what COVID and not vaccinating the whole world means in our lives. I'm here to tell you that if we do not recalibrate revolute, we do not have some level of uh, a, a passionate reshaking up of this global system, we will be doing this over and over again. With climate, with health, with whatever else the world seeks to throw at us. I'm gonna to start to end so that we can have a conversation. And Sridhar is going to tell me when he's ready for me to do that. So we need to shift the global power system. That is what recalibration looks like. We need to shift it away from global North institutions and high income countries to low and low middle income countries and global South institutions. We need to practice allyship. We need to go truly to learn what is going on in those places that we discuss in these hallowed halls. We need to bring together relevant voices, especially those of vulnerable and marginalized communities. We need to bring them to the decision making table because it is only then when we understand, and I will use my language because I have told you that my culture and my philosophy is not written, but that it is oral, that the language, the Yoruba people, that we, we tell stories. So my story is that it is the person who wears the shoe who knows where the shoe pinches. You cannot tell me where my shoe pinches or assume for me where my shoe pinches because you are not wearing my shoes. You don't know where I have calluses. You don't know where I have corns. So what is critical is putting the systems and the supports in place to enable this to happen in reality. It is not enough to say the representation will be included in panels. It is not enough to say that a national expert from Abuja or Delhi has to go to a meeting in New York, in Geneva, because already they are disadvantaged, because when they get there, they're uncomfortable, they're cold, they don't understand how the systems work, they feel like they're alone in a room, they feel isolated, they, they're not part of the social structure. Let me tell you about how social structure works. Let me tell you about how colonialism has worked. You see, the real decisions in life, we all know this, those of you who have been to business school and those of us who have audited business school classes online, know that the real meeting happens before and after the actual meeting. So when you invite people in to a meeting, the decisions typically have been made because colonial structures made decisions in the shooting ranges when in, during hunting in the cigar rooms when the men were smoking cigars which is why we also as women were excluded whilst they're smoking cigars whilst the hunt is going on whilst the lodge is having their their meeting that is where true power lies in all societies of this world and that is a colonial structure of power and until we are able to acknowledge outwardly and say that we are willing to allow true inclusion into those places of power, the universities of be it Kings, Oxford, Cambridge, these hallowed halls, Harvard, these hallowed halls. We need to understand that how we came about is not how we're going to end. And those institutions themselves must be willing to accept the change that must surely come. And I speak also to my brothers and my sisters in the global south, and I know there are many online, that not everything is a fight. That we must work together collaboratively, collaboratively hand in hand. It is not a revolution in terms of let's burn the place down. No, it is a revolution in, in how we work together because there are those who would want to say, well, now you did this to us. So now we must do this to you. No, two wrongs do not make a right. 
it would be wrong for us to also now come in and say, well, now we don't want any white people or white men should not be in any positions. That is also wrong. We as a world are getting this wrong. I talk to so many of my young friends who are, you know, Caucasian or, you know, relatives. My husband is brown, but his mother was white. His father was half white. So we have blonde, blue eyed family members. Go figure. <laughs> Genetics is a fascinating thing. My daughter's cousins get very confused when they all go out together. <laughs> She's giving me filthy looks. But I have these conversations with them because they say we feel guilty now. And we can't, you know, and I look at some of you in this room, we can't feel guilty. We have to find a way to together, come together to have these difficult conversations so that we can together shift the system going forward. We all have a role to play in achieving a more equitable world. Everything is about people and how we interact with each other. I noticed that the late Paul Farmer, a dear friend and mentor again wrote, that health justice illuminates a blind spot in modern political philosophy, your book, Sridhar. I encourage you all, all of you, to reflect on what your own blind spots might be in engaging and interacting with others and the blind spots of others which stop us from acting equitably and treating others as they wish to be treated, respecting and celebrating our differences and our commonalities, especially the right to health in its most holistic form, the definition of health being the absence, not just the absence of disease infirmity, but of social, economic, physical, mental well-being. Philosophers and academics should help shape a discourse about the world that is informed by many voices. That includes female voices and voices from the global south. We need to avoid the danger of a single story, as Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie has said, and ensure that our world order is based on multiple narratives and sources from outside Western-based academia. We have much to learn from female leadership in matriarchal societies, and that, is a topic for another day. But for now, I'm going to take a break and allow you to talk to me. Thank you. So, um, wow. So thank you. Thank you very much for a compelling, inspiring talk and an uncomfortable talk as well. Um, so uh, for the audience and for people uh, online and in the future who will you know, who will watch this recording. Um, so let me uh, first thank you for making time and, and for giving us uh, insight into your experience and wisdom. So we have 45 minutes before the drinks come. So there's half an hour before the drinks come, but 45 minutes. Uh, I, I would like to talk to you for 15 minutes, just you and me, and then we will open it up to conversation, if that's okay, yeah. um, to people in the audience and also people online. So, um, I've sort of been thinking about what should I, what should my first question be in, in all of this stuff. So I think, let me just go with my intuitions because we know each other. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm terrified. No, 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 no. So, 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 uh, so I think I'm, I'm going to start with the practical. So in case people aren't familiar with uh, how you have come here, why we are here and stuff. So the kind of, uh, movement that you pierced through our kind of consciousness, I would say, is December 2021. Is that right? The Omicron. The Omicron moment. The o Omicron moment. So uh, Omicron was uh, spreading 
and you had something to say to the world and what so what was the message that you had to, to say with, <laughs> with what the what the world was saying that was a uh... Um, yeah, it, it was a pivotal moment in this pandemic for various reasons. One of the reasons being that it's why we are here where, where we are today, because everyone tried to say that Omicron was mild. But that, that for me, that moment was the moment where countries started to, to lock Africa out. You know, the UK, um, US, various parts of the world started to lock out African countries because we in Africa were the ones who had discovered. It wasn't because we had it had started with us, but we had just discovered it. And the 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 the, the science of Africa was what had shown the world that there was actually another variant. And what I said in that moment, I remember being interviewed by a lovely lady on BBC, poor woman, I think I traumatized her for life. Um, but I think what I remember saying to her is that had 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 COVID started in Africa, it was quite clear that the world would have locked, locked Africa away and thrown away the key. And I still believe that today because that is what is what, that's what we're seeing play out with with Ebola. I mean, it 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 was it was a shocking moment of political irresponsibility. I mean, there were several shocking moments of political irresponsibility in the pandemic. And to my mind, I mean, had we had proper adults in the room, um, politically as in political leaders at the very, very beginning of COVID in January 2020, December, January 2020, I believe the pandemic would not have lasted this long. But then the second one was the Omicron moment where the countries of the world won't try to lock away Africa, that they had refused to vaccinate. They had refused to allow us access to vaccines. So therefore we weren't vaccinated, but you're telling us that there is a variant that you think is coming from unvaccinated people and we're locking the door. And I said it was not going to happen. And there was this BBC moment that apparently went completely viral. And, you know, I mean, the most exciting thing for me actually was that Lewis Hamilton retweeted it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So I think that um, you're being nice about it. I don't remember you being so nice about it <laughs> then. But I think what you said was basically the global media is racist. Yes. Um, it's racist in a number of ways because you're basically saying that this is somehow an Africa virus versus a virus that was discovered by Africans. There's a significant difference between those two things. One is you, you know, you make us sort of the problem. The second is you give credit to the creativity and ingenuity and the ability that Africans can do science, right? I think that was yes, the, absolutely. That was the kind of important distinction, and suddenly people got it. They're like, oh, there's a difference between discovered in Africa, discovered by Africans versus the Africa virus or something like that. Um, so I think that was the moment. And we actually proven, I mean, we have proof that it's just our countries are too polite. And because our culture, as I described some of our philosophies and our cultures is about respect. And um, so philosophically as well, it, we're disadvantaged because we knew that it had come from outside. And quite frankly, we knew where it had come from. Yeah. So, so, that, so that's, you know, we could have a conversation all day about that. But I think your point that had this epidemic pandemic virus originated in an African country, I also don't have any doubt that there would have been a pandemic force that would have arrived and that would have shut down borders and that would have tried to control it. The problem here was that no one was going to invade China and China was not going to do what it wanted to do. And so by the time anyone got an idea of what was going on, it was already sort of in multiple countries, right? I think that was the, the idea. And I think I still believe that that's true. Yeah, is that the absolutely. reason where we are today is because, so if this had happened in Texas, yeah. we would be in a similar kind of position. If this has happened in the UK, we would be, this happened, uh, if it happened in Africa, of course, we would have a, a very difficult, different situation. So, so the, the idea of this conference is, or this event today, is that, you know, as you know, a bunch of political philosophers had come together in 2020 in order to help the COVID response. And you've been very nice and keep saying, oh, philosophers are so clever. But can I just say to you, for two and a half years, no one really wants us around. So what is it that makes philosophers cover but you don't policymakers don't actually want them around what do you think why why are there no philosophers at the who sort of in the leadership sort of you know talking about ethics why is the press 
writer of Tedros writing the speeches about ethics and justice and equity rather than, you know, as you say, a philosopher or an ethicist? Like, what, what do you think is going on or any, any of these global health organizations? That's a very interesting question. I mean, first of all, I, I, I can't speak for the WHO because I don't work for them. I mean, I'm appointed special envoy. It's a totally honorary position and I sort of it's an ambassadorial position. So I, I don't think I'm able to give a policy position on that. But I think you guys are clever. And I think maybe everyone's just terrified of you. Um, for starters, <laughs> um, I think people are maybe just and, and it, it, there seems to be a sort of um uh, mythical nature to oh philosophers but you're really just you know i mean you're just regular folk really um <laughs> but with the that the, the bring a particular perspective to things and i think again when i said that we all need to talk together more it is not just global south and global north i think what this pandemic has shown us is that we have been too siloed in our thinking we have been too siloed in our approach so we need philosophy i mean i have i speak to you regularly with you know sort of ethics and philosophy questions because i understand the need the need for that and the need for us to reshape and to 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 to, to revolute in that way so i agree that the the health world needs more philosophers needs more ethics thinking, especially as we're coming now into, I mean, for instance, let's use real time examples. You know, the, the, the NHS, and let's use the UK, since all of you are here, mostly, I guess, are based here. The NHS is about to be overwhelmed again. I said that at the very beginning. You know, there is going to be a very difficult choice that will have to be made by political leaders. I mean, never mind poor Kwesi Kwateng, or maybe not so poor Kwesi Kwateng being given his marching orders today. Sorry, Linda. <laughs> being given his marching orders today i mean but how foolish really um but the 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 politicians around the world are going to have to make some sort of a decision about these rising covid rates as we go into winter and this is where ethics and this is where philosophers come into place this is where people have to have these difficult conversations around come on i mean how are we going to message to the world that COVID is not over? How are we going to message to the world that it is not okay that five to 600 people are still dying every day? And that I think is part of the, 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 the ethical, philosophical messaging at this moment that is desperately needed. And then on the gender piece, which we have talked about before, um, we continue to, to fight that fight. Yeah. Um... So I want to just sort of use my last five minutes to talk about the ACT Accelerator. Um, so what I understand it is that essentially in early 2020, um, a group of uh, sort of a handful of men felt as though they were going to be able to design and deliver a global response that would contain this pandemic. Um, and I'm going to make the statement that it failed, right? And that it's you know struggling. That sort of original concept failed, and now we're at a, a different place. What do you think uh, they were thinking when they were uh, they came together and said, "Oh yeah, we're going to design, deliver, fund, and you know solve this pandemic." But tell me, help me understand, if you can, uh, because you, you now sit around the table with these people. So I want to understand how, yeah, tell me if you can, or sort of help me understand how they thought that they could do this in that sort of uh, collective. Well, um, let, let me explain what I understand, and I don't disagree with you that the ACT Accelerator, ACT Accelerator had two objectives. It was product development, it was equ equitable access. And on equitable access, it failed completely. On product development, yes, we have vaccines and tests and treatments, but the most important thing is to be able to have vaccines, tests and treatments to get them into people and to get them to the people who need, need them. And I have said this repeatedly, that on equitable access, it was a fail. On product development, yes, because that was where the money was put, but the money was put there because it was corporations, it was governments. But when it came to, as I said in my in my in my talk, when it came to the people themselves, we did not care um, about you know a handful of men. Well, they've said it themselves. They sat around at Davos, which I you know I, I talk about this a lot. That the whole concept of people 
you know, taking world leaders, including Africans who are wearing head ties and big flowing gowns to a place with lots of snow where they're now slipping and sliding and looking extremely foolish because it is not their natural environment is just a weird thing to me. And that in itself is a power dynamic that we as a global community need to start looking and understanding that, you know, we, we need to start moving some of these convenings that have typically been in the global north. We need to move them to the global south. I mean, I convened, as you know, Ports to Arms, um, a summit on, on COVID earlier this year where the global health leaders came to Abuja. And yes, they were chopped by mosquitoes. And yes, they had a difficult time in some instances, but they came and they saw the reality. Some of these were the people who wrote on the back of a of a of a handkerchief I think it was or a napkin and they designed COVAX and part of the act accelerator why do I think they did it I don't think I can tell you why they did it because you say I sit at a table with them I mean I I sit at a virtual table with them because I chair them every Thursday but they did it because they were they were, they were, they were considered all powerful they were considered all knowing they are the powers that be in global health and because nobody has challenged that and the reason i think i was invited to sit at the table was because i was one woman who was unafraid and dared to challenge it both on television and on radio and said what the heck is actually going on here um what did they think they were doing i think they truly thought that they could from behind their various desks bring world peace <laughs> and deliver what was needed to deliver to the world. But it was what I said earlier, Frida, they did not understand the world. They did not, I mean, there are times that I asked, I, I was in Geneva a few weeks ago and I asked somebody who's in the administrative side of things, that how you know how do you see it going and just sort of a little evaluation of my own chairing I mean and this chap turned to me and he said well you know it's great but he says you don't just read the chair's notes that we give you that you give a lot of maybe one could say too many interjections of practical examples of your own experience I said that's because I'm the only person in the room with lived experience is that not why I'm here and, 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 and I think until we as a global community begin to understand that we cannot exclude that lived experience, we are going to get to the same failures of equitable access that we did with the ACT Accelerator. I mean, I can tell you that there is not a single antiviral yet on the African continent. There are none. I can tell you the diagnostics are a nightmare. And even as we're talking about Ebola now, you know, let's not just even talk about COVID. If we had community level, community based um, clinics that had rapid diagnostic tests, tests for Ebola, if anybody had bothered to invest enough in that, I mean, surely that is just, I mean, that's not, you don't even need to be a ethics or philosophy professor to understand that that's just common sense. I mean, let's just have these tests, let's invest in them so that the minute we see one case, we're not panicking, we now have it in Kampala, because nobody has diagnostics, but because people are assuming that something is malaria, and then it turns out to be Ebola. Um, we, we have not prepared, the world now talks a lot about preparedness. And for me, I don't like that word preparedness. I like to call it a dynamic state of readiness because preparedness is almost has this sort of static laid back tone to it. The ACT Accelerator was, was set up in the image of the global health world, but actually the global development world as it is today. It is not an, in itself very different from the rest of the world's dysfunction. And, you know, Shrida, the world as we have it, the Bretton Woods institutions were set up in 1944, post Second World War. They were set up to rebuild Europe. And I think we all forget that, you know, be it WHO, be it the World Bank, all of these institutions, UNICEF, which was the beginnings of it, they were set up to rebuild Europe and North America after a war. They were set up in the image and in the ideals of those who they were meant to rebuild. They were not set up to rebuild us. And that's why I say a re revolution is needed because we have tried to squeeze ourselves into these place places that don't look like us. They were set up to look like and to serve a rebuilding of Europe. And yes, we ha now have a Ukrainian war and um, a Russian war a re in, in, in Ukraine, which sadly the world is going to gather behind, not sadly, good, the world's going to gather behind it. But at the same time, we're hearing like countries 
countries like Norway have cut their development aid by to, from 1%. Norway, of all countries that have made the most money in this, in this, you know, increased oil prices, they're going to cut their development aid by 0.2%. Two, three, or something, and because all the money is going to the Ukraine. So, what the Bretton Woods institutions, what these global multilateral institutions are telling us is that we are not here for you. We are here for us. And until we can recalibrate the system so that it is for all of us, then we need to start talking about, it's not just about putting a black man at the top of WHO and saying we have done inclus inclusivity DEI. I mean, one of the things I posit is that had Tedros of, of um, who's, from, who's from Tigray, Northern Ethiopia, had Tedros at the beginning of the pandemic, head of WHO, had his name been Theodore from Cal Colorado, President Trump, but badly behaved number one, and, and Boris Johnson, badly behaved number two, would have taken him a whole lot more seriously. President Trump stopped funding to the WHO. Who does that in the middle of a pandemic? Said this man was talking rubbish. That was racism. That was institutional racism. Institutional racism is what got us to where we are in this pandemic today. Because had they listened to what that man was saying when he was saying it, had they not seen his black face and thought, what can this one know? What can this one know because he's a black man from Africa who was a minister in Africa? What can this one know because he's not one of ours from Welcome, or he's not one of ours from Gates, or he's not one of ours from whichever institution it is in the world? This is what has gotten us to where we are today. And I defy anybody to tell me differently because had the United States done what we know the United States can do, the Ebola of West Africa crisis in 20, I forget when it was, I was very involved with that, I was in Nigeria. When the president of the United States, it was then Obama sat up and said, this thing is not going to, it's not gonna take over the world. The US sent DART teams, disaster assistance response teams all over the world. They sent up clinics. They shut that thing down. But we had Donald Trump, who is a racist and had, had no belief in the man who was at the head of the WHO. They had, they bullied that man and continue to do so because he does not fit into that smoking room or the whiskey room or the shooting room. Heck, I drink more whiskey and do more shooting than he does in those sort of spaces. So if we want to really talk about the real racial issues and the racism and the deep, deep thinking, that means that the institutions of the world at this moment are not fit for purpose. That is why we need to recalibrate them. Because had Tedros from Ethiopia, Tigray, had he been Theodore from Colorado, this pandemic would have ended two years ago. So thanks. Um, I wish... Um somehow I could uh, give you all the experience and knowledge that I have so that you have more tools for your, for your talk. So there's this professor here named Adrian Blau, and as a result of Black Lives Matter, he gave a lecture, um, which kind of um, blew open some things. Uh, and the lecture was essentially, while you were talking about the current politicians, he basically showed how Immanuel Kant was a racist, how Locke was a racist, how Mill was a racist, and how for all these years, we who've been doing philosophy have just essentially ignored all these different things and continue to focus on it. So, so today has been very much about calling things for what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been a hard, hard day, but I, I, uh, um, but I want to now hand over to the audience um, and also to ask, uh, someone must be watching the, the Zoom Q and A. Um, so, are there any comments or questions that people in the audience might have? So, this can I wouldn't. Um, you can ask her pretty much anything, um, and she will she will be able to answer it. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your attendance and KCL for this invitation. It's a fascinating lecture, and I thank you for that. This is not a critical comment, really. It's come up about to the powers that be. Question to you and yourself is, how do you support global, global, global justice? Can we start with those in power that fear justice? Hmm. 
Can we start with those in power that fear justice? That's a good one. Um, I had a Machiavelli quote somewhere in my head that's gone away about the status quo. Um, and it is very difficult to start with those who, who fear justice. I myself deal with this on a daily basis because the status quo gives people certain powers, it gives people certain privileges, and they don't want to shift that system. And that's why I said that we cannot recalibrate, we need to have a revolution. I don't know why, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's a, it's a violent revolution, but I think we really do need a critical mass of people who will turn this thing upside down. Um, the global infrastructure is broken, um, not just in health and development. In I mean, the bro it's, it's just broken. We're living in a broken world. We're living in very perilous times. Global leadership is particularly poor at the moment. And I think citizen leadership is more and more in many countries beginning to rise up and, 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 and take, 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 take the place of that. I mean, even my own country, Nigeria, we're seeing a rising up of young people that we have never seen before who are trying to you know, eject the status quo and, and, and the powers that be. I don't know that you can change with those in, in power who don't believe in justice because, but the issue, the question I would put back to is the how do we take power from those who don't believe in justice? Because nothing is given, it is taken. And so, you know, um, Sridhar talks about the moment. I mean, I, I had a conversation with somebody the other day. It was really quite amusing to me because I said, oh, well, you're so establishment. I'm like, really? No, I am not establishment. I was sitting in my house. My husband will tell you happily, maybe not happily making apple crumble, but, <laughs> but you know, definitely snogging the dog when all of this sort of blew up and, and our lives have just turned upside down. But that's because I believe that you can't, we, everybody as an individual has a part to play in this. If we add our power to get collectively together and our voice collectively together and don't compete with one another, but we, 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 we coalesce this power, then we can remove the power from those who are in power who do not believe in justice. I'm not advocating for a coup in any way, shape or form. Um, um, but I'm ad advocating for a revolution, and that means taking the power from those who do not believe in justice. There's a hand in front. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh God, it's hard. Um, this is not a question, but more of a comment, which is, so I am in the philosophy side of things. I'm a philosophy PhD student here at King's, and you've been very complimentary towards philosophers, but something I kind of want to say against the philosophy institution is a lot of what you have been speaking about is something philosophy does not do very well, uh, whether it's including lived experience in the way that we think about global matters or any justice matters, whether it's about incorporating emotion into thinking about good arguments or good convincing ways of uh, or convincing people of things. The other thing that really struck me was the way that you presented your arguments was with passion and emotion. And I don't know if you've been to many philosophy talks, but they can be really, really boring, right? It's like someone stood in front of you, often white men, which is what you'll see if you go to like our philosophy department, it's really uh, full of white men, as most are, and it's a really dry presentation of most things. And so I just wanna like say what you're offering is also something that something like the Philosophical Institution could really benefit from, which is another way of doing academic thinking with these really beneficial outcomes, which is hopefully a move towards justice. And um, so like I said, this is not a question, it's more of a comment to not give philosophy too much of a good name as you have done. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm going to respond really quickly because, I mean, I think I have given due respect because I, I, do, I do have due, a lot of respect for, for the deep thinking and what have you. But I also did say that we need to be practical. And um, and and I think we do. And I think I, this is why I'm saying the whole system needs a reshift, the, the whole system. I mean, the, the, the way in which we communicate on different levels, be it in the medical field, be it in philosophy, the world has changed. My my daughter talked to my daughter the other day about something to do with social media. And she said, well, if you need a social media intern, I'm too old for you. And she's 26. And she said, you need a 15 year old or a 16 year old. And, but we haven't changed. You know, the world is changing around us and we're refusing to change 
um, to, to change with it. And yes, I mean, I don't do boring very well and I don't, I can't deal with it. And I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't be able to sit through boring lectures because the world at the moment is there's too much around there that is, is taking away our attention. And if we want to keep the attention of, of the students or even the media or, 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 you know, the, the I, a little anecdote, I bumped into Christian Amanpour um, when I was in New York, um, or or Anga were just walking by each other, and you know we we it was like a oh my gosh big hug and what have you why because we've had some really engaging interviews. I mean she interviews tons of people all the time, but we need I, one of the things you as philosophy school also potentially should teach is communication skills and messaging skills. You know, and this is, goes back to what Sridhar talked about with, you know, why does WHO have the speechwriter writing about ethics? Well, you know, maybe if you guys all get together and they give you a, a speechwriting seminar and you give them an ethics seminar and you can say, well, the ethics in that speech you wrote are pretty bleh. Um <laughs> And maybe we can start to cross-pollinate. I don't know. Good. Any... Yeah, so if I can't see you at the back, could you raise your hand? Hi, is there any, was there someone? Okay, there is, okay. So we'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I want to ask, um, so I'm, I'm a Brit, but I lived nine years in Johannesburg and I've just come back a couple of years ago. And um, I wanna ask about how, uh, about how to deal with, um, I suppose, medical disagreements with, cultural roots. So, I mean, when I, one of the first of many experiences that changed me when I was there was that um, uh, a, a young woman who was a student said, came and said she was, um, she had been hearing voices. And I said, well, we have a mental, you know, the university has a mental uh, health uh, unit. And she said, well, she'd talked to Sangoma and it was the calling. And I, I, I just wasn't sure what to say. Um, and I'm still not sure I know what to say, but, um, because on the one hand, you know, I, I, you know, uh, I, you know, my view is that there's a problem to be addressed and there's a way to address it, or certainly was then the alternative, you know, but, but then at the same time, my view is also that I respect her and her, you know, where she's coming from. And I just don't know what to do in situations like that. Or, and I suspect it applies much more generally. I'm thinking of the, you know, the Ebola outbreaks and burial rights or whatever so i'm just i'm just very interested to know yeah what you think when those sorts of conflicts arise oh this is lovely how fascinating <laughs> voices my husband would tell you that i hear those all the time um <laughs> You heard me talk about Ifa, you heard me talk about culture and tradition and philosophies, and this is a much deeper, deeper, I mean, we don't have time and we can maybe talk about it over a drink or something at some time so that I don't go on and on forever, but I love that question. I think, but it's also number one, first of all, the understanding that you don't have the answer is a good place to start because that you didn't immediately send off to, to, to mental, mental health. There is much about this world that we do not understand. We live in a world that is not merely physical, it is spiritual as well. And there is much about it that we don't understand. And those cultures that are closer to that spirit world in many ways, because they don't have the distractions of, of life that we have in a London today, or you know, in, 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 in communities where they commune much deeper. Um, it, it, there's a fine line between the spirit, to my mind, between the spirit world and the physical world. And now people are going to start texting me and saying, Dr. Alakaja is a Sangoma. That is not what I'm saying, but I believe that we take our lessons, our historical lessons, and we take a lot of, for those of us from indigenous cultures, we take a lot of that from way back in history. I'm an introvert, extrovert by nature, and that is because I spend my introvert time listening for those voices, not necessarily a voice, but listening for that deep thing within. That is often what guides a lot of what I do. You know, there used to be, there's something that, that, I, that I follow a lot, and again, my family are here and will attest to it, that I read a book once about ancient, in some ancient cultures and traditions, 
that people would stop when they traveled. They were doing long journeys, of course, by road, and they would stop and wait for about five days so that their spirit could catch up with their bodies. The problem is we no longer stop and allow our spirits to catch up with our bodies. And so we are a lot less productive than we would normally be as a people because there is so much power in rest and in peace and in silence. Um, and I think for your question, somebody like that who is hearing voices, I mean, the immediate sort of what, colonialism and Anglo-Christianity and the sort of Hebraic faiths have brought to us in Africa with that colonization with you would have heard that and some of us said ha blood of Jesus <laughs> I mean <laughs> and would instantly have started to pray in some sort of you know tongues or whatever but I don't subscribe to that because I believe there's a very fine line, just as they say, there's a very fine line between those who are dysfunction, between madness and genius. There is a very fine line and sometimes you find that sweet spot. I like that question a lot. Um, so uh, so we've had a lot of questions online from different participants. Most of them have been comments. Um, and also sort of they can't hear sometimes. So we fixed the sound uh, a while ago. Um, so I like one question that I'm going to prioritize. It's the one that says, so you said that the, you know, the act accelerator, as it originally said, is failed. Um, but I don't think you said the COVID response has failed. But this questioner is basically saying, you know, you said the victory of the pandemic has sailed. Uh, in, a, in other words, our response to the COVID pandemic has failed. Uh, do you think so, or do you think that there is any way to correct the current situation? So Mwibat, um, Oduala, thank you for your statement. First of all, I most certainly did not say the ship to victory over the pandemic has sailed, and I did not say our response to COVID pandemic has, has failed. Um, uh, um, so let me correct that. Uh, we have to be very careful. The Act Accelerator was not the response to COVID. The Act Accelerator was a group that was brought together to coordinate A, product development, and B, equitable access. The actual response itself was led by the agencies. The response, proper response, was read, had led by WHE emergencies working with different other organizations around the world. It is very important that we do not conflate the two. One of the failures, however, of the Act Accelerator was their failure to message. It was their failure themselves to communicate properly to the world exactly what it was, the Act Accelerator was. And yet it was set up because it was set up quickly. It was set up, you know, they will tell you they were set up in, in, and it was in, 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 in a crisis. But I find that people even within the system themselves do not understand what the Act Accelerator is or what it does. I can tell you what I do within my role as co-chair of the, the principals group of the Act Accelerators. Every Thursday, I chair a meeting, which includes the head of Global Fund, Peter Sands, which includes a head of WHO, Dr. Tedros. It includes a head of Gabby, Seth Berkeley. It includes a head of um, CEPI, Richard Hatchett. It includes a head of FIND, Bill Rodriguez. It includes a head of UNITAID, Philippe Doniton, the head of UNICEF, who's always represented by Omar Abdi. And it includes, um, and the head of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the head of the Wellcome Trust, Sir Jeremy Farrar. Those are the nine men, I call them the nine silverbacks that I deal with every Thursday. And those men have worked every Thursday. So as much as we have criticized the outcome, we, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. We must also acknowledge that, yes, they were flawed in their execution, but they, they have gathered every Thursday for two hours every week since the pandemic started. That is one part of the ACT Accelerator. The ACT Accelerator is not the response. The response is what Mike Ryan's shop leads, is what other, you know, that is the response to COVID. So I'm, I have definitely not said the ship has sailed um, to the response. What I have said is that COVID is not over. And we're behaving as though that is. And that is the very strong interlinkage between geopolitics, politics, and health. 
that we have not acknowledged as a global community. The ACT Accelerator, what do I see as next for the ACT Accelerator? That was very clear to me. I mean, the ACT Accelerator has not achieved equitable access. It's not over. There are those who wanted it to be because everybody is, again, back to the question about power. Everybody is about power in some way, shape or form. So there are those who would say, oh, well, let's set something else up. But we're in the middle of a pandemic. You do not exit the battlefield in the middle of a war. So perhaps we're prepared during this pandemic for what we're going to do for the next the next um, threat, be it climate, be it most likely to be a flu virus that will be the next pandemic and very likely that it will come sooner rather than later. But the ACT Accelerator as a structure that was pulled together got an A on product development because yes, we got the vaccines. I mean, these people invested the money in the research and development for the vaccines, for diagnosis and treatments, but then we kept them for those in high income countries. And we then decided that low income countries only needed 20% because surely they were going to be okay because a life in Abuja is not worth as much as a life in London. That was where the failure was. And that is where bringing, and so let me go back to what you said earlier, actually, Sridhar, you talked about when I was appointed, which I think is important because I was appointed a year into the ACT Accelerator, a year and a bit. And I was appointed completely to my shock, really, because I picked up the phone and it was Dr. Tedros on the other end. And I didn't know the man. I'd met him maybe once before. We're all in the global health world. And he said, hello, and how are you? And how's your daughter? And if you've ever been on my Twitter, at Yodi Fiji, if you've ever been on my Twitter, my daughter, my family, my dog are very much part of my Twitter life. So he asked after my dog and my daughter. And I was like, you know what? We're in the middle of a pandemic. You do not have time to be shooting the breeze. What do you need? It's nine o'clock on a Saturday night. Lovely to talk to you. And he said, well, I would like you to chair or actually co-chair the ACT Accelerator and in doing so become WHO Special Envoy. And I laughed. I literally said, ha, ha, ha. I said, this is Yodi. I'm the most vocal critic of particularly COVAX, which I think was one of the most problematic arms of it in many ways. Um, that you know, and he said exactly, he said, your voice is exactly what we need because your voice of practicality, your voice of experience on the ground, not just in clinical medical field, but also in geopolitics in relationships in that sort of balance of, of what is right ethics and what is wrong, that that is what we're missing and that is what we need. So they, he did try to correct it in that within a year. Um, and that experience has been interesting to say the least. Interesting is a, is a good word. So um, the, the question still stands, like what is the way to make the outcome more equitable and just given where we are now? See why I said he's scary? <laughs> what is the way to make it more equitable and just? What, it would, what would Act, Act A 2.0 look like? Is that what you're saying? No, if, if that's where you want to talk about. But I think the question is, where do we, like, how do we go from here? And how do we make it? How do we make the situation? Give us a, a path, give us an outline for what you think is the right way for. Well, I think we've lost the way in that, in that respect with this pandemic, because what we have done is we've bifurcated the world. So to what way would we go forward? The best way to go forward would be to ensure that everybody is kept safe right now from this pathogen. We would realign the, the, pol the political messaging from the high income countries that it is driving the inequity in the low income countries. We would realign and help them to understand that this virus and this scourge is still here and is still affecting the world. People are dying. Um, we would help the leaders of the global health organizations to understand that their that their, their focus on pharmaceutical industries and their, their almost slavish de devotion to, to pharmaceutical industries is unhelpful. We would help governments to mandate pharmaceutical industries to, to make vaccines, treatments and, and diagnostics a public good, a true public good, rather than make it the preserve of a few for a few. Um, that is what we would need to do in this pandemic. And, in, and, and I, would, I would say that we, we have gone so far down the line of COVID is, is something we're now living with that that is very difficult to pull back from. Um, 
for future pandemia, for a future Act A 2.0, for a future pandemic um, preparedness architecture, I would say the key thing would have to be the inclusivity. I would say that it needs to be led from the South. Because it, if it is not led from the South, the South is going to lose out. We, but, but, but that goes deeper into the global health architecture that we currently have. And what we need is to completely reshape and remodel that global health architecture. And without, you know, every, every, every time you say that, of course, there are men to typically who are in these positions of power. It makes them very nervous. And yet we need to then maybe go to the concept of allyship where those of them who are who are exiting certain jobs or or on certain boards step aside and deliberately say I step aside so that you Linda can step into that position so that we can and I, I will w walk alongside you and work with you for a year to help you to make the relationships and understand what needs to be done that it is the pathway forward a pathway forward would be for somebody like myself who is currently at the lead at the as a chair and co-chair and, 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 and a special envoy for the ACT Accelerator to be being told that, okay, Yodi, how do we crowd in other people like you with your lived experience, with your, your relationships so that we can make sure we do better the next time. But to do that, people would have to leave their egos behind. They would have to leave their egos at the door. And I'm not sure that our world is ready for that yet. That is the way forward. Um, but how do we mandate that to happen? We cannot mandate that. How do we ensure that people do not try to co-opt our voices? Those of us from, you're from India, those of us from, you know, low, low, mid, I mean, India is doing great um, compared to, to, to many of our, our countries, but how do we ensure that our voices are not co-opted? I cannot tell you how many jobs people have tried to offer me in the last few months or whatever that is, it's basically a job, a job to shut me up. Because if I can, you know, dangle a, a nice sweet carrot before your eyes, then you will stop shouting for equity and justice because I have co-opted you. So I tell them all the time that, you know what, I, I am really very well fed and looked after. I don't need any, and I'm, and I'm a woman. I'm not looking for power and ego. That's not my thing in life. I'm not looking for a big position, but that is what the West sees as inclusion of voices, is co-option of voices so that I can no longer speak with the freedom that I speak with about the racism and about the, the, the broken global um, 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 infrastructure. So I consider my, 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 my independence my superpower because it's the only way and we need more who can continue to tell truth to power. Um, and that's the only way it's going to change. For this current pandemic, it's going to have to be political. For future countermeasures platforms for Act A 2.0, we're going to have to have a deliberate saying, no, 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 not you men from the global north. Let us bring together the women, let us bring together the men, let us bring the scientists from the global south who truly understand how these things happen and let us put them around a table to help us design how we're going to move forward. We're going to have to actively acknowledge, like I said earlier, the privilege and actively choose to step away from it. Okay, I think with that, I want to thank you again for making time in your schedule to join us and to talk to us, uh, to allow us to record this conversation so that it lives and so that other people can have a conversation with you or so that they learn more about you. I've only usually only heard small snippets uh, of interviews, so I, I, I've learned quite a lot. Uh, and I hope that many of you have also learned a little bit more than just little snippets, but a lot more in depth about the story of what's been happening over the last two years, but perhaps decades, and also uh, what's on the table for the future. And I think it's been a really valuable insight that we usually don't get from anywhere else. So it's been, it's been really good. So let's say uh, thank you to our, our, our speaker for this evening.